And of course, there's a million different ways that you can slice and dice and try to compare the different networks and projects and so on and so forth. But to kind of bring it all back around to what I was doing, this particular uh, series of tests is a um, preferably full history validation of a, a given blockchain uh, performance test on a benchmark machine that I built uh, a little over three years ago. So I've been running these tests for th at least three years now. And the it's a very simple, straightforward test. Can I download a node for this network? Can I download node software? And can I configure it so that it's syncing the entire history of that network and and validating it. You know, not just downloading data, but actually downloading the entire history and checking you know every transaction, every block, uh, to independently verify that no sh shenanigans have happened on the network. You know, this is the what I would call ultimate security model that Bitcoin offers. And not all of these other networks offer it, or if they do theoretically offer it, um, it is already outside of the realm of possibility for most people to actually do it. And what I'm referring to there is specifically any quote unquote high performance blockchain networks. Um, there's really no way around the fact that if you are creating a ton of data, if you're allowing people to create, you know, hundreds or thousands of transactions per second on an open network, then the resource requirements in order to validate all of that stuff are just going to go through the roof. And so what I am trying to understand in a lot of these cases is you know, what are the trade-offs that they've made? How expensive is it or is it even possible for a normal user to independently verify that no one is breaking the rules on this network. And some of these networks are really interesting uh, in how they've set stuff up. But m most of the time, what you're going to end up finding out is that they are, they are creating much weaker security models and doing various things that they will call like fast sync or snapshot sync or or perhaps this proof of history that you were talking about <laughs> of you know uh they understand that it's no longer feasible to actually verify the entire history so instead they come up with a way that it's usually some sort of semi-trusted if not completely trusted uh checkpoint that is you know in recent history and then you just download that checkpoint and verify a few attributes about that and then start rolling forward. And so with Solana in particular, I think uh, when I tried to run that node, it downloaded a checkpoint that was about two weeks old. Uh, well, only took about an hour for my machine to get through all of that. But then it was never able to actually catch up with the tip of the blockchain. And Solana was doing like 500 transactions per second. And I was basically watching it get further and further behind until eventually my machine crashed because it ran out of RAM and swap space. And to be fair, my machine does not meet the very high minimum technical recommendations required by Solana. I was just interested to see how far it could get. But um, you know, some of these other networks I've been looking at, uh, they don't even make the, the software uh, available. Or if they do, like I, I was looking at the internet computer uh, network because I think it's also gone pretty high recently in the stats. And they didn't have any built releases of their node software. And then when I tried to build it myself, the build, build failed. Um, and then the, the further that I even looked into it, it's like, even if I am able to build the software, they're not going to let me connect to the production network. And there's, uh, you know, they have a bunch of reasons behind that. And they seem to have created a, a security model for their network that is fairly unique. We've never seen anything like that. But as far as I can tell, it basically requires gatekeeping by the foundation that has uh, built this network and this protocol. And, 
And I think that that is a common theme that we see across a lot of altcoins is that, you know, I wouldn't try to put a number on it, but a, a non-negligible number of these altcoins are really more like venture backed startups and a lot of the aspects of the network architecture and control over the rules and the code and whatnot are essentially uh, centralized at a single point of failure, which is one company that has raised a bunch of money. And, um, you know, maybe they make various promises or, or plans about how someday it's going to become less centralized. Um, but I don't think there are very many good examples of networks that have become less centralized over time. Usually uh, it goes in the opposite direction. So I would suggest that you want to start out as decentralized as possible. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things that when I look at, because you often hear these fantastical ideas and genius thoughts, et cetera. But then when you go to look at the project from the get-go, it's like apply to be a node or apply to be a validator or something. And I'm like, well, like immediately straight off the bat that's that's a red flag for me um and, and that was i think when i looked at solana you had to apply i think at the time i don't know if that's still the case but yeah um i think it is and you know that's another thing right is that as far as i'm aware basically none of these high performance networks are proof of work based so they tend to either be a proof of stake or some sort of proof of authority like this is this is why you find the gatekeeping coming into play because if it is basically setting up some sort of whitelisted consortium of validators, uh, I think that that's kind of like the, the ripple model. Um, and I think that, you know, a number of these other networks are essentially doing the same thing. Then, I mean, this is basically just a new type of social consensus, uh, except you know you have what is essentially a cabal that is saying you know we are allowing these people to be a part of our social group, and um, if anybody else wants to join, then you have to convince us to let you in, and uh, that's uh, that sounds eerily familiar to some other systems out there, so. I don't know. I mean, obviously the market has said that there is some value in these things. I just think it's not what I value. And I don't think that they're going to be able to offer the, the level of uh, permissionlessness and censorship resistant that we can find in Bitcoin. A lot of these proof of stake blockchains, they're, they have like a lead investor, which is like a hedge fund. And the hedge fund will buy up like the majority of the tokens so that they can stake and that they can control the governance. And then once they have pumped it, they'll dump the tokens on retail and then they go find another one to repeat the process. Yeah, I guess uh, with Algorand, I remember when I discovered it, I thought, oh, this seems like a really cool idea. It seems to work efficiently or whatever. And then I, I read into it and on their own website, they admitted like, quite a few faults. Like you had to, you had to, uh, like their entire white paper was built upon the fact that two thirds of the validators, I think more than two thirds actually, the validators were completely honest. I'm like, well, that's quite a lot of people you have to believe are completely honest just to make this thing work. And so I remember bringing it up with some Algorand people on Twitter and uh, essentially it just got, you know, sh sh shut down. But um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of that in the uh, altcoin space, especially with the proof of stake. Well, I was just going to say, you know, you can create whatever security model you want. And if you can get enough people to buy into it and believe that it's safe, then you can accrue a decent amount of value. Um, and, you know, maybe... Maybe they are safe uh, as long as you know that hedge fund behind it keeps holding on to all of the governance tokens and doesn't act poorly. But you know, that um, uh, that's so similar to the existing system of you know everything works fine until it doesn't, and you you just you've created so much systemic risk that you know the potential for this edge case catastrophe is just constantly looming overhead. And unfortunately, unless that actually happens, it's it's really hard to argue with people that uh, they should be more worried about it. Can you tell us what's new with Casa? Uh, let's see. I mean, the most recent thing that we've rolled out is uh, our most highly requested feature, which is uh, sub accounts, basically letting people reuse their uh, existing hardware devices to 
create separate buckets uh, to be able to manage their Bitcoin. Um, you know, this is a common request for people who they they may have different Bitcoin from different sources or have has different cost basis or you know, different tax implications, or maybe some of it is, is owned by different entities. Um, you know, just things that you need to keep logically separated. We've managed to, to build that into our system. The, the, the tricky thing, I think, compared to a lot of other wallets that make it possible to create uh, various sub wallets is that uh, we have a uh, essentially a key rotation feature in Casa so that if you lose a device, you can actually swap it out and you know, go buy a new one and plug that one in. And that was one of the things that created a lot more complexity for a feature like this is because now uh, if you do that, you're going to have to do uh, uh, more than one you know, Bitcoin transaction essentially in order to uh, migrate those funds over essentially from the old set of keys to the new set of keys. And we want to you know, make that as seamless and user-friendly as possible. Mm -hmm.